Hey guys, BuildZoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at a low-end X570 motherboard, the MPG X570 Gaming Plus from MSI. So this is the successor of the X470 Gaming Plus, which was one of the cheapest X470 motherboards you could buy. Um, the thing is, X570 across the board is far more expensive, so don't expect this to be anywhere, like, yeah, don't expect this board to be anywhere near the price point of the X470 Gaming Plus that it's replacing. Unfortunately, X570 is way more expensive than X470 just because of like the chipset cost and and uh, the PCIe 4.0. Before that, this video is brought to you by Dollar Shave Club and their starter set. Get your Dollar Shave Club starter set for $5 by using our link below, available individually for shave, shower, or oral care, or all together in one package. The kits can be customized to your needs with options including toothpaste and a toothbrush, hydrating shampoo, face cleanser and scrubs, body wash, or a razor with cartridges and shaving cream. Convenience is key and care packages can be scheduled to send when you need a restock. Go to dollarshaveclub.com slash gamersnexus or click the link below to learn more. Anyway, before we get into the VRM, let's go around and highlight some uh, sort of worth worth noted, noteworthy overclocking features. There's a BIOS flashback, uh, BIOS flashback button hiding right behind the, I think, USB ports over here. Um, so you can update the BIOS of the motherboard with just an 8-pin power connector and a 24-pin plug it in. No CPU, no RAM, no GPU, no nothing. Just just a USB stick with the right file format and the, a file with the right file name hit the button, you can update the BIOS. Um, pretty useful if you have the motherboard and a incompatible CPU that requires a BIOS update, which uh, considering like this is an X570 board, I really like, you'd, you'd be looking at buying like a next gen, like a uh, more newer than Ryzen 3000 CPU to run into that situation. So, you know, kind of a hard situation to encounter on an X570 board, I'd say, but it is a potential, like, that, that's what it's meant to, to solve. Anyway, next to that, we do get the 8-pin and the completely useless 4-pin. Um, we all know what I think of 4-pins on low-end, unnecessary 4-pin power connectors on low-end motherboards, so I'm not even going to go in, well, like, let's just put it this way. That can handle 384 watts. You don't need this. At all. Especially on a motherboard of this caliber. Like, if you overload that 8-pin, the VRM is already going to be gone. Um... Yeah, like this VRM is going to be gone by the time you overload that eight pin. So, you know, before you need that four pin, but but like if you if you actually pulled enough power to need the four pin, the, the VRM has no chance. Absolutely no chance. I mean, it, it can't even max out the eight pin. So anyway, moving on, we get some useful features like a bunch of troubleshooting LEDs over here. Um, so you have uh, CPU errors, memory errors, VGA, so GPU errors and uh, boot media errors. Um, you know, it'll just light up. So it's not going to be like, it's not as useful as a postcode, but it's significantly use, more useful than nothing. Um, and it's less obnoxious than having the motherboard beep at you, right? It, it'll just give you a little LED telling you, hey, you're, you're, there's something wrong with your memory or there's something wrong with your CPU. So um, pretty useful to have that. I, I like, I, I consider this a bare minimum for a lot of motherboards. There's motherboards that like, the, motherboards that don't have this, annoy me a lot like that's that's boards where it's just like okay well that's below the bare minimum for troubleshooting features as far as i'm concerned if you don't even have like little leds to indicate roughly what component you should be looking at super handy when doing any kind of overclocking so that's that and for clearing the bios you've got the clear cmos uh clear cmos jumper right here which i, I think they could have positioned that a bit better um, cause like sometimes what I do with say my systems is I hook up the clear CMOS to the reset button of the system, right? So that if you're of, of the case, so that if you're doing a lot of overclocking, you can just hit the reset button and it clears the CMOS cause, uh, well, the reset button isn't really that useful <laughs> in my opinion for a daily system that often. And if you're doing, if you're like setting up an overclock, you'll be potentially clearing the BIOS over and over and over again within a couple hours, right? So um, I think this could have benefited from being a button on the rear IO, arguably more so than the BIOS flashback. I think the BIOS flashback is one of those features that you use once and then never again. Because after you've updated the BIOS, it's like you can just use the BIOS flash utility in the BIOS, right? Like, or for, you can even update the BIOS from Windows, though I've never done that myself. I always go through the BIOS, so yeah. Um, but uh, still, um, 
like a bit more convenient than having to pull the battery though by by the time like depending on your gpu and like uh uh pci expansion card configuration pulling the battery or shorting that jumper might be equally annoying things to do right if you have like a three slot gpu and then a then another card in here <laughs> reaching that is going to be quite the adventure anyway um so that kind of covers all of the basic overclocking features that the motherboard uh, offers. Also, ignore these. Those are for troubleshooting uh, engineering sample boards. So those aren't going to be present on the real. Uh, like if you buy the board retail, those won't be present at all. You can just ignore them. Um, so yeah, with that out of the way, let's just get right into the VRM. So um, this right here is our vCore right there. And that is a eight. I don't know what I'm doing. It's an eight phase. And then next to that, we have a two phase SOC VRM. And for the controller, we're looking at an IR35201, which obviously does not support an eight plus two phase configuration, right? Or at least um, 35201. Um, this goes all the way up to eight phases, um, but it does not go up to eight plus two. Um, and uh, this is like, the thing is, this is a significant upgrade from compared to like the X470 Gaming Plus that this motherboard replaces, as this is like the default high-end voltage controller for high-end motherboards for the last several years. So, you know, like you're, you're getting a pretty serious international rectifier voltage controller right here with this board, and it is a low-end X570. So th this is th this is not like the che like this is definitely not cheap to do, um, though it is still I think like a five ish dollar chip. So it's not like you know, and I assume the it's uh, the alternative for the cheaper boards is like two or three dollars. So it's not a huge change in terms of the cost of like one chip. Like if that was the only thing you changed on the entire board, it's like five dollars. <laughs> but uh. Yeah, um, the, the thing is it doesn't do, like it doesn't integrate drivers and that kind of thing. So when you actually want to use a 35201, it gets more expensive than just the fact that you're replacing the controller. Because if you're replacing a controller that integrates like three or four of your phase drives, then it's like, well, now you need to buy three or four new drivers. Um, anyway, here it is running, configured as a four plus two phase. Um, and uh, on the back of the board, we of course find a bunch of doublers as well as a dual driver now all of those are there we go um so the first chip over here is a dual driver so that's our two phases for uh the soc and then here we have a doubler and i don't know why i'm changing the capitalization of the d's so double. no there we go doubler and then we've got two three and four doublers over there and all of these chips are international rectifier ir 3598 uh, because the 3598 is a dual driver with an optional doubling function so for like this one over here you have two phases from the ir35201 go in and then two completely independent phases come out because it literally is like uh, having two C chl8510 drivers in one chip except this is weaker than a chl8510 because like a CHL8510 is the same size chip, except it drives one phase. So it's significantly, it's it's a pretty uh, significantly stronger driver than this one. But uh, yeah, like the, you only have to worry about the strength of the driver if you're trying to drive some really like slow power, like, well, high capacitance power MOSFETs, right? Which this board doesn't need to worry about because uh, th this is using some pretty normal low side power MOSFETs. They're not the... Not the worst ever, but like if like the the eight five ten is a good fit for something like a sixty eight ninety four, or in some cases there's GPUs where they'll actually like put two sixty eight ninety fours in parallel, and at that point it's like yeah, you need a pretty serious driver to switch those kinds of MOSFETs on and off at a reasonable speed. Um, so there a thirty five ninety eight wouldn't really work very well, but here it's fine. Like these are pretty normal MOSFETs. So anyway, here we have one running as a doubler. So one PWM signal in goes in, and then two drive, uh, two sets of drive go out to the actual phases, fully interleaved. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of the control scheme that you're looking at with this uh, VRM. And for this board especially, this has some pretty major benefits because uh, since it does use discrete MOSFETs, the uh, efficiency of the VRM is quite heavily dependent on the switching frequency because like the one of the big advantages like high uh, power stages have over discrete MOSFETs is that they 
have significantly lower switching losses because they the the MOSFETs inside a power stage are optimized to switch much faster than your discrete like your normal discrete MOSFET. Um, and the end result is that you can go from like 300 kilohertz to 500 kilohertz and not really notice a significant change in heat output. Whereas on something like this, at 500 kilohertz, these MOSFETs would produce way more heat than they would produce at 300 kilohertz. So with a VRM like this, the doublers make a pretty major, you know, give you a pretty major efficiency advantage. And uh, you also get reduced or, you know, if you decide to run them at a higher switching frequency. Um, so let's say you're going from a four phase at 450 kilohertz, which is the X470 Gaming Plus to what this is, which you could do eight phases at 450 kilohertz. Well, you can have significantly lower output ripple at roughly the same efficiency. Or you can go and drop the switching frequency all the way down to like 250 kilohertz, potentially have still slightly better output ripple because you are on eight phases, not just four, um, and yet have much better VRM efficiency because each of the high side MOSFETs is being switched on and off 250,000 times a second instead of 450,000 times a second, right? So pretty, uh, pretty major, uh, pretty large drop in uh, switching losses right there because of that. Anyway, let's talk about efficiency. Now for efficiency, I'm going with 300 kilohertz switching frequency at each of the phases because that's a pretty normal switching frequency to run even discrete MOSFETs at like three. Well, you could make a design of VRM around a lower switching frequency than that, but they generally don't do that. <laughs> like you generally don't do that kind of thing. So yeah, um, 1.2 volts uh, output voltage, 300 kilohertz switching frequency and 12 volts uh, gate to source voltage so that that's the the drive voltage for the mosfets this is important because you can drive most like you can switch a mosfet like this with five volts but the thing is if you do that you get a significantly higher rds on they also take longer to switch on and off and uh well you end up with uh, worse overall vrm power efficiency so uh, with, with a motherboard like this, it's like they actually you get best efficiency with like 10 volts. The thing is on a motherboard, you already have a 12 volt rail. So it's like, why would you convert your 12 volts into 10 volts just to drive your MOSFETs? It's much easier to take 12 volts and just j jam that into the MOSFETs. Uh, the MOSFETs, you know, they'll handle that kind of voltage that fi just fine. So 12 volts gate to source uh, drive voltage for this. Anyway, um, so with those operating parameters and 300 kilohertz switching frequency there. So that's the operating parameters for the VRM that I'm going to be doing the efficiency with. And it's also worth noting that when I do discrete MOSFET VRM efficiency, I do not factor in the power consumed by the drivers. So like the the IR3599 uh, 98s on the back of the board, those produce heat. I'm not factoring those in for convenience, um, which is pretty lazy of me. The reason why I consider, like don't factor them in is they don't really make that much of a difference to your overall uh, power consumption. They might be like one or two watts in total, right? Spread across the entire VRM. Um, they might be even less than one watt. The reason why it's important that I'm not factoring them in is that low outputs, that makes discrete MOSFETs look really good because I'm not factoring in the like fixed amount of power loss that you get from having driver, like from the drivers. Because if that driver has to switch the MOS, like as long as that driver is turning the MOSFET on and off, that is power being lost to turning the MOSFET on and off. Like that costs energy to do. Um, and I'm just not factoring that power loss in because at high current outputs, it's like a very small portion of your overall heat output. So not particularly important at low current outputs. It makes discrete MOSFETs looks kind of silly efficient compared to power stages, because if I have power stages, they automatically factor in the driver losses in their uh, heat output. So like I would actually have to do more work to remove the driver loss from like a power stage, uh, you know, uh, efficiency calculation. So I'm just just pointing that out as like if at low current output, uh, what discrete MOSFET, uh, if this looks really efficient at 100 amps output, it's mostly because I'm ignoring the fact that the drivers also burn a, maybe like a watt or two. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that makes this VRM look a bit better than it should, but it's not super important, which is why, as I said, for convenience, I kind of ignore that. Um, so 100 amps output, which is a little bit like, that should be pretty close to the amount of current that's say a maxed out 3800X or a maxed out 3700X uh, poles. Uh, this VRM will be producing about 12.5 watts of heat at uh, 300 kilohertz, so about there. At 125 amps, which is around where you'd want to, like, that's the maximum current you'd really want to be running a 2700X on. 
um, you'd be looking at about uh, 18 watts of heat output. Going up to 150 amps, you'd be looking at about 24 watts of heat output. And at this point, um, it's worth like, th this is a pretty serious amount of heat. And so let's talk a little bit about the cooling system that MSI has uh, designed. Well, actually the thermal management that MSI is doing on this VRM. Um, so there's a huge advantage that this, the X570 Gaming Plus has over the X470 Gaming Plus in that this VRM is not one blob of four phases. It's six phases and then two phases. So what basically you have is three fourths of the heat output of the VRM goes into this massive heatsink right over here. And I know it doesn't look like it has a ton of surface area, but the profile for that heatsink looks something like this. And then the MOSFETs are at the bottom of that, right? So you actually have a good amount of surface area. It's just not very visible. Um, so, and I've tested motherboards with this style of heatsink but on uh, B450. It works really well. Like this style of heatsink is awesome. I'm actually not sure why for high-end motherboards, if you wanted to just kind of make, like, make your life easy and make really good VRM cooling with the, and, and just eliminate like the IO cover, the easiest thing to do would be just to put a big metal block that d doubles as both a VRM heatsink as and an IO cover, just does both. Because you'd have a ton of surface area for VRM cooling and you'd also have the whole aesthetic benefits of, of an IO cover, right? Without actually having to resort to a, uh, to a, to a piece of plastic like most motherboards do. Anyway, so I'm a big fan of this style of heatsink and it's only handling three fourths of the overall heat output of the VRM. The other one fourth of the V-Core VRM is actually dumped into the heatsink up here. And uh, that one has a similar profile. Like it doesn't look like it has a lot of fins, but it looks kind of like that from the, the, the side. So it has a decent amount of surface area as well. And, you know, in the case of the 24 watts that we're throwing at the VRM at 150 amps, this is roughly where like the 12 core would max out on say water cooling. Um, that would be only eight watts of heat. Uh, no, not eight. That's way too much. Six watts of heat being dumped into that heat sink and 18 watts of heat being dumped into this heat sink. In my testing with uh, the B450 mortar titanium, this heat sink is more than capable of handling 18 watts. Like it's not a problem for this heat sink whatsoever. Six watts for this heat sink, same situation. Absolutely not, not an issue. So yeah, like this is not the most efficient VRM ever, right? Like if we compare this to some of the other motherboards, X570 motherboards I've covered, this is actually quite an awful amount of heat for just 150 amps. But if you throw a big enough heatsink at it and you spread the heat out in a clever way, you don't need a stupid efficient VRM, right? There's kind of two ways. You can design a good cooling system or you can design a really efficient VRM. Uh, if you design a really efficient VRM, you can throw the heat sinks out the window, potentially. If it's efficient enough, you don't need heat sinks, right? If your VRM isn't efficient enough, you need to get clever with your cooling solution, and that's kind of what MSI's done here. And, and it doesn't, like, it doesn't even need to be super elaborate. Like, this is still basically just a, a, an aluminum block with some fins cut into it, so... You know, it, it's not like state-of-the-art heat sink technology right there, it's just that big block of aluminum with a lot of surface area turns out works pretty well. Um, especially when you don't try to dump all of the VRM heat into it and you spread it over an, even another block of aluminum. So, you know, the 12 core, I would be really surprised if this motherboard struggled with VRM thermals when overclocking the 12 core. And potentially with the 35201, MSI does give you the option to change VRM switching frequency. So if you have the 12 core, you might find that um, you have so much thermal headroom that you can actually just like raise the, the switching frequency a bit to maybe get slightly better overclocking by reducing the VRM output ripple. Um, so yeah, like I, I'm a I'm a pretty big fan of this, uh, this VRM considering that it's on like a low end motherboard now. Anyway, um, moving up to like 16 core uh, current draw figures, like 170 amps. And this is, keep in mind, this is all overclocking. This is not at stock. If you're running at stock, the AMD's TDP is like 105 watts. So uh, if we assume that AMD actually law, like agrees to the laws of physics, which they don't because they're the most, like the fun fact, most X470 motherboards override the 2700X's TDP from 105 watts to like 130-ish. So that's why 2700Xs don't run on their rated TDP. It's because the motherboards tell them, hey, it's fine to pull 130. So the 2700X does. But uh, um, like still, at stock, you wouldn't be looking at like th these kinds of current draw figures. That's very much overclocking. Um, 175 amps, uh, you're going to be looking at about 30 watts of heat output for the VRM. 
um, which would translate into about 7.5 watts of heat on uh, this heatsink and about 22.5 watts of heat on the other heatsink, which I think should still, like, th this is approaching, I think, the, the limits of what this heatsink can handle. But depending on how much airflow you have, this should still not be a massive issue to deal with. So yes, the 16 core could probably run on this motherboard just fine as well. And then going all the way up to 200 amps, which would be a completely maxed out 16 core, um, you'd be looking at about uh, 38 watts of heat. So you can see at this point that like the increase in heat output is getting pretty drastic for every step of the way because, well, the RM efficiency curves look something like this. Or wait, right? Or heat output for uh, phases looks something like that. So we are now getting into this area um, because this VRM is really not meant for handling a ton of current. Um, like these, these are halfway decent MOSFETs, but they're not incredible. Um, and so at 200 amps, this VRM I'd say is pretty, pretty close to maxed out. The heat sinks should, you know, you'd be looking at close to 30 watts on this one, which I'm not sure how well that'll handle it. Uh, this one will handle that. And close to 10 watts on this one, which 10 watts on this one I don't think is actually a problem. 30 on the other hand, that is a lot of heat. Um, so I'm not sure how that, that would work out for that. But uh, yeah, that is like maxing out a 16 core. So obviously not something this, like this is not something I would say the motherboard is really meant for. And, you know, um, you can always just throw a fan at the heat sinks. That tends to take care of any VRM thermal issues really, really quickly because fun, like if you have an AIO, the airflow around the VRM tends to be non-existent. If you have a tower air cooler, uh, you still generally don't actually have that much airflow over the VRM or what airflow you do have might be like, uh, used up air that has gone through an, like a freaking heat sink, right? So it's already hot from the CPU. So... Yeah, um, but throwing a fan somewhere near the VRM, like potentially what would make sense is to put like a fan that sits like right here, right? And blows air up through like under the, the VRM heatsink and just channels it out the top of your case. That would potentially work really, really well. Um, but, you know, like if you're sticking a 12 core on this motherboard, I'd, well, no, 16 core. 12 core is fine, as I, as I said earlier. Like, six, 12 core should be fine. 16 core, you might start needing to get a creative with, like, fan, uh, uh, you know, placing a fan around the VRM. So, anyway, that's the VRM efficiency, and I just realized that I forgot to mention what MOSFETs this motherboard is on. So, each phase is made up of a single high-side MOSFET and a single low-side MOSFET. A high-side MOSFET is a 4C029N from On Semiconductor. Um... This is actually a pretty solid uh, high side MOSFET, but what really, what I really like about this VRM is that low side, because for, like, the thing is, this is a 4C024N, uh, right? Yes, it is. And it, this is a 2.8 milliohm RDS on uh, low side MOSFET. And the reason why this is important is a lot of other cheap motherboards go for like 4 milliohms RDS on. And a very, very, very large portion of the heat output of your uh, VRM is caused by P equals I squared times uh, R. So this is heat out, current, resistance of the MOSFET, right? So if you are at 4 milliohms, like that, like literally it's I squared times 4 instead of I squared times 2.8. Well, 0 0.0028 versus 0 0.004, right? Because milliohms. But anyway, you get the idea. So this is actually a pretty major improvement over a lot of other mother... Like, as far as low-end MOSFET... Low-end motherboard MOSFETs go, this is a really nice low side because they tend to be terrible in a lot of cases. So... Yeah, and that's why this VRM, you know, which... Uh, like, it's still not super efficient, but it can still... And it's not that different from, like, the VRM on the X470 Gaming Plus. It can still just about handle, you know, the 16 core. And it should have no problem with the 12 core because of the quite clever cooling system uh, setup that MSI has here. So anyway, let's move on from the VRM to the memory section. For the memory topology, we're looking at a daisy chain layout. So, uh, and we can actually see that on the back of the board, which is kind of neat, in my opinion. Like, I, I'm always a fan of anything that you can just look at and be like, oh, that's what it is. Because, yeah, so this is a daisy chain and you can see it most clearly, like right here, right? So you can see this trace comes in, hits this pin, then it goes on and hits that pin. 
And that tells you it's a daisy chain because, well, it goes from one dim slot to the next dim slot. And uh, if you have a daisy chain uh, topology, then the top, uh, like this topology basically favors two dim configurations in general. Um, you can, like, it really depends, like, there's a lot of BIOS tuning you can do to, like, work around the downsides of daisy chain. So the, the main problem with daisy chain is that if you put a dim slot in this, if you have two dims on the same channel like that, then the timing for signals going to this dim is a little bit different from the timing for signals going to that dim. And uh, that causes, like, overclocking issues, right? That's what restricts, the, will potentially limit the maximum memory frequency you can run. Um, on the flip side, uh, like, if you just have one dim in daisy chain, it actually works really, really well. So if you have it on the, the second dim slot like that, that actually works really, really well with daisy chain. So this motherboard should be great for, like, 2 by 8 gigabyte memory configurations, should overclock amazingly well on this. 2x16 kind of depends on, uh, really depends on the memory sticks and how well the motherboard actually supports said memory stick. Because uh, there's kind of like 2x16 is a kind of weird configuration. Also, I don't know uh, how well 16 gigabit memory chips overclock. So uh, things get strange at that point. But um, assuming MSI supports whatever DIMMs you are using properly, this should actually work really well as well compared to say 4x8. Because 4x8 is just inherently not supposed to work as well as on a daisy chain as a 2x16 should. Um, but there's BIOS stuff that can also happen that will maybe make 4x8 work better than 2x16. But generally, daisy chain should favor 2x16. And then, you know, there's 2x32, but 2x32 is like a huge question mark because I don't know any, like, I've not seen any testing done with that con memory configuration yet. Um, I plan to do some testing of my own for it, but you know, like it's going to be a while before I manage to do that. And I don't yet have any X570 motherboards, so I don't know how that's going to work out on X570. Um, 4x16, on the other hand, is also a huge question mark because it super depends. Like it's like 2x16, except with like 4x8 problems added on top, right? Like that's the thing is just like, it's a mess. So yeah, but board is daisy chain, so it should prefer these two dim slots. And at least if you're running 2x8, it should overclock really, really well. And then for the other higher capacity configurations, it kind of depends. Like, hopefully there's going to be some motherboard reviews co covering the different memory configurations that work well on each motherboard, but that tends to take forever to test. And I don't really know of any reviewers really doing that. Um, and I don't want to do that myself, because as I just said, it takes forever to test. Um, though I do try to sometimes test it myself a bit. Anyway, um, so yeah, that is... Oh, I forgot to mention the uh soc vrm and the memory vrm but the the thing like th that gives you an idea of how important they are so the soc vrm uh as i said earlier it's two phases the mosfets are qa uh 31 1 1 and 6s from ubic semiconductor um and they're dual nfets so high side and low side integrated direct in, into one package I have no data sheet for these. It doesn't really matter that much because the system on a chip of a Ryzen doesn't really pull that much power, but it's it's just like, yeah, I, I couldn't give you more information on these if I tried because I literally don't have any more information than that. And then for memory power, we are looking at a single phase with two high side MOSFETs and two low side MOSFETs, which actually this is one of the more powerful single phase memory VRMs out there for X570 motherboards. It also completely doesn't matter because it's mostly down to what you do between the memory slots and the CPU socket with, with DDR4. DDR4 doesn't really pull that much power. So yeah, th this, like, it's a single phase. It's got nice, it's got the same MOSFETs as your vCore VRM, but I wouldn't, um, you know, focus on it too much because it's mostly going to come down to the, like, the BIOS of the motherboard and the trace layout of the motherboard, um, which... Fortunately, I can't tell you for sure that this is good, but it is a daisy chain, and so it should work really well with 2x8. Then everything else is just kind of like, what does the BIOS support best? Um, I'm not really concerned about the VRM for DDR4. It doesn't pull enough power. So yeah, that is it for the uh, for this video. So thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comment. Oh, wait, I should have done like a conclusion. Well, yeah, that that's... Um, that's it for the video, you know, the, the MSI X570 Gaming Plus, which is uh, 
a low-end X570 motherboard. That does not make it cheap. It just means it's like at the bottom of the product stack for X570 from MSI. I think it's like the second to the bottom of MSI's product stack. Um, there's one other motherboard that's like even lower end than this. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, you know, it should handle a 12 core just fine. Um, 16 core should also work, but the VRM cooling might actually get a bit of a workout at that point. And uh, yeah, so... That's it. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support uh, Gamers Nexus uh, directly, there's the Gamers Nexus Patreon. And if you'd like to, you know, support us by buying like some merch, there's store.gamersnexus.net where you can pick up uh, things like uh, mod mats and uh, other Gamers Nexus merch. So I forgot, <laughs> should have probably written that into my script properly. But uh yeah, so that that you know, so if you would like to support us, that that would be really awesome if you check that out. There's links to both down in the description below. And uh, if you'd like to see more content from me, uh, I've got a, ch a channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking where I do more overclocking stuff. So that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.